good morning. We are in part one, two, three, four, five, six. We're in part six of a series called Directions. And uh, if you guys didn't know, we disaffiliated from our denomination a few months ago. And so the question is, who are we? So we're going to be exploring the question of who are we and where are we going? And um, in case you guys were wondering, you're like, oh, you know, like, yeah, where are we going? Like, are you going to tell us where we're supposed to be? And, you know, it's like what we need to change in our church so that we could be that. Like, no, 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 no. This series is basically we're putting words to who we already are. There should be nothing new. So everything we talked about so far for the past few weeks, you're going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, that is who we are. So I hope that's the reaction you're having. Um, In answering the question of who we are and uh, where are we going, we decided to answer these questions in seven parts. And here are the seven answers, and they're all in directions and arrows. Like, for example, the first week we talked about how we as a church make decisions based off of the promises of this, what, what God teaches us, where we're going, right? At the end of the story, what does it look like, and how do we be a part of that? The second week we looked at looking backwards. Like, what does our past tell us that we're supposed to do? What does the Bible tell us we're supposed to do? The third week we looked outwards. Like, what, what's our stance, what, what is our stance on outreach? How are we supposed to love on the people around us? Then the week after that, we did inwards about inner healing. How does God want us, God wants, to, wants us to be whole? What does that look like at our church? And then last week, we talked about the word that we made up with word, because <laughs> we are called to journey together with one another. And today, we're looking at the, the, that one right there, the up arrow, upward, which is celebration. Celebration. Okay, so... The way we're going to start talking about this is by going to my favorite book of the Bible, which is Genesis chapter 1. Okay, so Genesis, in case you're not familiar with this, okay, and by the way, because we have youth here today, I'm going to do my best to explain everything that, you know, you might think like, oh, we already know this stuff. We're going to do our best to, to explain everything so that, that no one gets left behind. Okay, so Genesis chapter 1 is an ancient poem. It's a song, and like a song, there's like verse... Chorus, verse, chorus, 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 bridge, 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 chorus, chorus, chorus. That's what Genesis chapter 1 is. And so the story, the, the, this poem gives us a story of, of how God created the world, how the world is a good place because of what God has done to it. So he's like, he created the light, he created, you know, the waters, and then he created dry ground. And after he finishes the dry ground, this is the song that is sung. God called the dry ground land, and uh, the gathered waters he called sea. Now, this is a chorus. The chorus goes like this. And God saw that it was good. That's the chorus. We'll see this repeated over and over again. And then next thing he does is that he's like, okay, out of this dry land, we're going to create some plants and, and vegetables and fruit. That's how this part goes. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And the chorus repeats. And God saw that it was good, 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 good. Okay, then there's another part where he's like, um, it's like, okay, we're going to put stars and suns, you know, all that stuff in the sky. That's how this part goes. God set them in them, the the sun, moon, and stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate light from the darkness. And the chorus goes, God saw that it was good. Very good. You're catching on. This this is the, you know, if you wonder why Christian music has, like, we repeat the chorus so many times, this, this is our source material. Okay, let's keep going. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing in which the waters teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And... God saw that it was good. You're catching on. This is very good, right? And then at the end of the song, God creates animals and people. This is how that goes. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Very good. Okay, let's go one more time. So God created humans, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And this time, the chorus is a little different. He adds extra words to it. This is how it goes. God saw, that he had, God saw all that he had made, and it was very, very good. It was very good. 
Right. So, like I said, this is a poem. In case, like, you're, like, in middle school and you're learning about, like, like, my son is learning about the Estrelopithecus Neanderthal and Homo erectus, like, right? And he's like, so that happens way before, he's like, yeah, it happens way before this story was written. Because this is a song. This is not a science text, okay? This is a song, and there's a chorus, and it repeats itself over and over and over again. And so this song was sung by the early Israelites, and when they sang this song, What is the message that they were supposed to pick up from this song? They were supposed to pick up the idea that God is in the business of creating good things. If you look around this world and you see good things, that's from God. Wow, the sun looks beautiful. Like I feel like the warmth. God. Oh, the breeze. It's like it's offsetting the heat. This is so good. God. Oh, the field looks so green and the stars. When you can see them, it looks nice. God. Right. Everything that is good in this world was created by God. Right. And then there's another interesting thing about this poem is that there's six days of creation and the seventh day God rests, right? So the first three and the second set of three days, they correlate to each other. So day one, God creates light. And then on day four, he creates the sun, moon, and stars, which give off light. It's almost like God creates something and then he creates something that's supposed to partner with God to do what God was doing on the first column. Does that make sense? I know that's kind of confusing, right? On the second day, God creates like a land, and from that land comes trees and fruits and stuff like that, right? On day five, we have seed-bearing plants. They're planting seeds, and they're, so God is in the business of creating plants, and now we have plants that are creating more plants. On day three, God creates, um, uh, he creates the, the land, and on this land, there's animals, and now we have animals that, that could give birth to more animals. So we have God that's creating good things, and then we have God's creatures that are participating in creating good things, right? So another thing you're supposed to pick up from this song, not only the fact that, is that God is, a good, is in the business of creating good things, he also is excited. He's like, God says it is good when he, we, his creatures, participate in creating good things, right? So everything that we see around us is a good thing, but we know that's not the reality we live in right now. We discover that if you live your life for any amount of time, you know that, there is, that the world isn't always good. This is because in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see this, chapters 1 and 2, we have that God made everything good. But if you read on to chapter 3, you discover that, well, the world isn't as good as we thought it was because we messed it up. God said, this is how humans and God should relate to each other. And humanity said, Psh, like, I, I, we, we'll do it our way. And God looked at people and said, this is how you, should guys, you guys should get, you know, get along with each other. And then humanity looked at God and said, we could do better. We're, we have our own way of doing things. And we mess it up. God says, hey, humanity, look at all the things I created. You guys, this is how you should relate to those things. And, no. We think we know how to do this better than you. And so we rebelled against God, right? And so in chapter 3, we have the broken relationship with God and others. So when we look around the world, we discover the world's not perfect. It's because of Genesis chapter 3. Now, the next point I'm going to make is like the most like obvious thing, but I want to make sure that we all understand this. The Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1, not Genesis chapter 3. I know you're like, ooh, <laughs> this is very important. Chapter 3 is a chapter of destruction, death, curses, brokenness, Right? When you're, in their, you're living your life and something bad happens and you're like, that's not how it's supposed to be, that's absolutely correct. The world we're living in right now, the broken world we live in right now, is not how it's meant to be. Maybe you guys could think of a few examples. You get in a big fight. You feel far from God. There's injustice in the world. Something bad happens, and you're like, this isn't how the world is supposed to be. And the answer is, that's absolutely correct. This is not how the world is supposed to be. But throughout the scriptures, after Genesis chapter 3, there are countless stories of God, the good God, breaking into this broken one to make things better. Here's one example. There's a story in the book of Genesis, obviously, called, his name is Jacob. Jacob has a twin brother, his name is Esau, and they just don't get along with each other. And the primary reason for that is because the parents are playing favorites. The mom loves Jacob. The dad loves his brother Esau. 
Okay. And so the dad being like, you know, being the head of the family in that culture, like the men had like all the power of the family back then. Right. And so he says, everything I have right now, I'm going to pass it on to my favorite son. Now the mom is like, but what am I, my favorite son? Right? What do you, what, what do you have for him? It's like nothing. You know, he's going to get everything that I have. And so the mom and Jacob, they, they plan something out. They're like, hey, how about this? What if we deceive your brother and your dad at the same time, right? And then we'll live happily ever after. Remember, broken world. This is a Genesis 3 world, right? Everything is falling apart. Relationships are falling apart. And they think we can make this better by deceiving them. Yeah, they'll fix everything. It won't get worse, right? So they deceive him. And the father, who's on, who's on his deathbed, accidentally gives everything to Jacob instead of his favorite son, Esau. Jacob is like, cha-ching, we win. And as they're celebrating, here we have Esau that's like, I'm going to kill you. And then the mom's like, okay, now run. Jacob, run. Right? So he, Jacob's running, running, running. And now he's in the middle of the desert. He won everything, but he lost everything at the same time. It's a weird story. Now, something interesting happens when he's running away. So here's the illustration of that. Desert has nothing except for rocks, right? So Jacob, next slide. Jacob is running, running, running into the scene right here. And then he's like, what am I going to do? I have nowhere to go. I'm supposed to go to my uncle's house, which is far, far away. What am I? He's like, you know, I'm just tired. So the next part of the story goes like this. Jacob uses one of the rocks as a pillow and goes to sleep. I don't think he had a sleeping bag, but, you know, but yeah. <laughs> he carried that with him. Okay. Now, something interesting happens while he's asleep. He has this crazy dream. And I don't want to get into what this dream is. Basically, he sees like a staircase, like this big pyramid staircase. And he climbs, you know, he sees angels going up and down. And basically, he wakes up from it saying like, what was that? I don't know what that was, but that was totally God. He's convinced that he just had an encounter with God. He's totally convinced that in this broken story, right? The story is about broken relationships, that God is trying to penetrate through into this dark, broken world. So when he wakes up, this is what he says. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. So he wakes up the next morning, right? And Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. Like you do when you have a crazy dream. Just, no, right? Like, what, what, what is this about? Okay. This story takes place thousands of years ago. They did things differently than they do today. So here's an illustration. So he gets up in the morning. He's like, oh, surely this is God. He takes the rocks here, next slide, and he makes a pillar. And then, next slide, he pours oil on it. What is this, Jacob? What are you doing? Now, back in those days, when you, saw, when you thought you saw something amazing happen, you have a reason to celebrate, right? This is his way of celebrating. This is like their version of, like, next slide. This is their version of a party. Okay, like, like, let's celebrate the fact that God was here. Like, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like, nobody's here. And um, I experienced God. This is God from Genesis chapter 1 that's trying to break into a Genesis chapter 3 type of world. He's trying to make something good out of the bad things. Now, we don't know exactly what this pillar looked like, but um, it was such a big deal that Jacob said, I'm going to rename this place because nobody lives here. I guess I can, I'm the first person here, so I can name it whatever I want. So he's like, I'm going to name this place Bethel. Bethel, Beit, B-E-T-H, means um, the house of. El means Elohim, so the house of God. Right? He's like, I'm going to call this the house of God. So in Ex uh, if you go to Bethel today, you'll find something like this. They, think, they don't think this is the actual pillar. But um, they're like, this is probably something similar to what he built back then. Okay. So he pours oil on it to show that this is different from anybody else. If somebody else were to walk by this place and see this stone, they'll say, hey, something special must have happened here. This is his way of celebrating that God has broken into this broken world. So when Jacob experienced a glimpse of God's goodness, he celebrated Celebration is a big theme in the Old Testament. Here's another story. In the book of Exodus, there's a story about a bunch of people called the Israelites who are slaves. And they've been slaves there for years and years and years, for generations. And so they're crying out to God, this is a broken world, this is darkness, this isn't right, this isn't just. Would you please do something about it? And they cry out to God for years and years and years. 
And then one day, God decided to answer their prayer by sending this guy named Moses. Okay? So, next slide. So here are the Israelites. There's more than four people. There's like tens of hundreds of thousands of people. But I didn't want to draw all that. Okay, so, right? So God saw, they call to God, would you please rescue us? We don't want to be slaves anymore. He sends Moses, and he says, Pharaoh, would you let my people go? He's like, no. Would you let my people go? No. And so God starts sending plagues. He's like, no, no, not going to do it. No, 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 no. Finally, on the 10th plague, God goes up to the Israelites through Moses and says, guys, tonight is the night you're going to be set free. I'm breaking into this broken world. I'm going to set things good. I'm going to set you free from slaves. But what you have to do is you have to start packing. But don't pack too much because you're going to be out walking for a long time. And uh, you, want, you want to make some bread too. So uh, make some bread, but don't, don't wait for it to rise. I want you to make those flat cracker-like breads because, uh, you know, because you're going to be running into freedom tonight. You don't have time to wait for your bread to rise. So make something called unleavened bread. It's like crackers, basically. They're like, okay, sure. And so that night, God sends the spirit of death. Next slide. He sends the spirit of death, right? And Pharaoh's like, okay, now get out, get out, right? So now they finally get out. And while they're out, they come across the Red Sea. And they're like, okay, now we're stuck. And so Moses is like, God, what do we do? He's like, put your staff in the water. The water splits. Next slide. And so they make it onto the other side. Pharaoh stops chasing them. And now they're in the middle of the desert. And they're like, yay, we're free. We're not slaves anymore. But they're like, but wait a minute. We're in the middle of a desert. We have nothing to eat. We have nowhere to sleep. What are we going to do? And God's like, here, I'm going to give you some stuff that's going to help you. So miraculously, God's, he's like, here's a tent, and here's some bread, and here's some meat. He gives them food. And now they're traveling in the desert, and they have a place to set their tent. They have something to eat. They're fine. Okay. A few years into this journey, God stops them and says, there's a few things I want to tell you, like some new rules I want to give you guys. And in this, he gives some really strange rules. I want to go over a few of them with you because it tells you the nature of who God is. Here we go. This is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. The Lord said, these are my appointed festivals. Now, festivals are like parties, okay? Here are some festivals. Here are some parties that I want you to partake in. The appointed festivals of the Lord, which are the uh, are to proclaim as uh, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. So what, this is what he's saying. He's saying, "I'm going to give you some rules, and these rules are you have to party." <laughs> Why? And wh- how many? Well, actually, I have seven parties for you guys. Seven festivals. Why? Because. I broke it into the darkness. I broke into the broken world and brought good into it. And I don't want you to forget that. I want you to celebrate that. Just like how Jacob, when he was in a broken situation, God broke into it. And because of that, he celebrated. I want you to do the same thing. Well, what did you do for us? Well, I did a lot of things. Like what? Well, um, remember how the, you know, the spirit of death came over and Pharaoh let you go. And because of that, you didn't have time to bake your bread. Well, we'll have a party called the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You're going to do that every year. It's like, oh, okay, right? Uh, what about um, you came out here and you didn't have a place to stay, so God said build tents, and I had, like, God built his own tent so that you feel like you were actually camping out with God. Okay, let's celebrate that too. What do you want to call it? It's like, we'll call it the Festival of Tents. They weren't that creative in their you know, naming these things, right? I'm like, well, what about the time when we were like out there, we're looking for food, we couldn't find any food. What are we going to do? Oh, yeah, God gave us food. What should we call that? We'll call that the Feast of, of First Fruits. Okay, let's do that, right? So they, God's like, here are seven things you need to celebrate every year because we are a people who celebrate good things. And at the end of that, here we go. Those who do not deny themselves on that day, meaning On these special days, you're not supposed to do any work. If you have homework, you don't do it that day either, right? If you're like, oh, I just have a little more extra paperwork to do, you don't do that on this day. This day is a special day. Don't do any work, right? If you don't deny yourself from those things, you're going to be cut off from their people. You're not one of us if you work on the day of a feast, are you that serious about partying? It's like, yes, it is so important for us to celebrate. And then, in case you didn't get me the first time, I will destroy from among their people 
anyone who does any work on that day. And in case I'm still fuzzy on this, you're fuzzy on this, let me, t- let, me, let me reiterate. He says, you shall do no work at all. God is serious about this. If there's the Ten Commandments and we were to add an 11th one, it would be thou shalt party, <laughs> right? Or maybe to make it even clear, <laughs> or else. Like, if you don't party when I tell you to party, then you're not one of us. I will destroy the work you're doing because this is that important. These Israelites who were slaves were set free. God set us free. Let's celebrate that, right? God accept. oh, there's this one party that says, you know, no matter how many times you mess up, I will give you a second chance. That's called, um, um, it's called the, the Day of Atonement. It's a festival of atonement, right? It's like God accepted us regardless of our bad attitude. Let's celebrate that. Right? God took care of us while we we're in the desert. Let's celebrate that. Remember if we were pitching tents and God's tent was right there in the middle? We were so close to him. Let's celebrate that. Because one day, we're going to feel like we're not close to God. But as we were forced to celebrate these things, we're going to be like, but there was a day back then when we were close to God. When we feel like we have nothing, we're going to be like, but you know, there was a day that God gave us something when we really needed it. You know, one day when we're like really messing up and we're feeling far from God, you're going to say, oh, we messed up bad. We feel far from God. But there was that day when God said that he's going to give us a second chance. These celebrations were part of their DNA. It was so important to them that they partied in the way that God told them to, to celebrate. So from these stories, what we learn is this, that it is important that we stop, recognize God's goodness, and celebrate it. So, I hope you get the, get the point here. Let's celebrate the things that God is doing. When we see things break in through the darkness, into this light, we're like, oh, let's celebrate that. But as it turns out, that's not good enough because God has more thoughts on this idea of celebration. In the book of Psalms, they address this interesting idea that when you are celebrating, right, because you just experienced God's goodness in the darkness, right, you're like, that's cool. And now, 10 years later, you're like, Hey, remember 10 years ago? Yeah, we're still celebrating that today. That's good. 40 years later, I'm really old now, but you know, remember back then when God did that? I was a celebrate. What about 200 years from now? Your great 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 grandkids or whoever, you know, they're going to be like, is God good? I don't know. So, what they started doing was we need to take these celebrations and we have to impress them onto the next generation because we want the next generation to know that God is good. Right? So this is a psalm, chapter 145. This is a song. It says this, I will exalt you, my God and King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. It's like, let's, you know, for not just my life, but the generations after me, we need to worship you. We need to talk about how good you are forever and ever. And then he says this, one generation commends your works to another. We celebrate God, not just by saying God was good to me, but we have our children worship God for saying he was good to my father and my mother. We worship God because he was good to my grandmother. He was good to my great-great-grandmother, grandfather, to our ancestors. There's something about worship and celebration that is not just about us. That we do this, we stop, recognize the goodness of God, and we celebrate, and we bring other people into it. So one of the values of this church is that we don't just celebrate. We invite others into our celebration. Being a Christian isn't only about celebrating well. Passing on the reason for our celebration to the next generation is just as important as us raising up our hands and saying that God is good. This is the very reason why early on, even before I started coming to this church, Lori said, no matter what happens, we're going to keep the kids in service during the worship time because we want to impress onto the next generation that it's important to sing to God. We pass on our values to the next generation. This is why we invest in our children's ministry. We also invest into our youth ministry. And one day, when the youth and children grow up, they're going to pass that celebration on to the generation after them. And it goes on and on and on and on. That is one of the values of this church. So, Upwards. This is, you know, after each arrow, we form like a little paragraph, little line that tells you where we stand on this. For upward, 
Westlight invites others to celebrate with us the good, the good works of Jesus. That's who we are. Now, notice we didn't use the word worship anywhere in here. And the reason is because sometimes we associate the word worship with singing, whereas you know, worship is like a bigger thing. But uh, just so that we don't we get out of that mindset, yes, the way we celebrate is by singing songs to God. But we also celebrate each other through relationships. When we see something dark and we see good light, like light shine into it, we say, wow, God is good, right? When we eat food that's like, mm, God, you made food, this is so good, we say, praise God, let's celebrate that, right? When you hear a good story and it resonates with you in a certain way, you're like, wow, God is so good. Like the way that, that certain stories move us, we, we celebrate God for giving us good stories, when we have good community, we have a community that feels more than just random people coming together, but we feel like family, we say, wow, that is so good. Let's celebrate God. When we rest, like ever since, ever since having kids, and you're, you're like, I've not slept for a good four hours since, I, you know, but now one morning you wake up, you're like, whoa, I slept for eight hours, I feel great. You had good rest, you're like, that is light shining into the darkness. Yes, let's celebrate God. <laughs> if you have good health, after a long, many years of bad health, you say, well, today I feel great. Let me celebrate that by worshiping God. If you watch the Dodgers make it all the way and you say, wow, let's worship God. Yeah, you could worship that. Or you could curse God, I guess, in case you're like a not. Anyways, if you see great artwork and you say, this artwork is so beautiful, it moves me. You can celebrate God. If you watch a movie or if you hear, if you hear laughter and it just brightens your soul, you can celebrate God. That is light shining into the darkness. If there's a broken relationship and you're reconciled, you can celebrate God. If someone is generous towards you and you benefit greatly, and that's an answer to your prayer, you can celebrate God. Or maybe you're the one that's being generous and you gave away something that was dear to you, but for some reason you feel richer for it, you can celebrate God. So the question is this, how should we celebrate how should we do it? There are so many ways to do it. Now, what we're used to doing is we come here on a Sunday morning and we sing. That is a great way of worshiping, celebrating. Uh, you could be creative. We could have potlucks, right? We celebrate like Easter's. We have potlucks and then we're like, whoa, God is, God is risen from the grave. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, let's eat celebration. We could do that, right? I don't know. You could bake a cake and say, you know, hey, let's celebrate God. You could do that. You could, there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, boba party, anyone? I don't know. <laughs> there are so many different ways of celebrating God. You could be creative with that the way you like. But there is one specific way that the church has celebrated for about 2,000 years now. It's an ancient way of celebrating God. And these celebrations, there's a whole category. It's called means of grace. Or in some circles, they call them sacraments. And in case you don't know what means of grace is, let me see if I can explain it. Um, there are some things in this world that are really important to us that are invisible. So, for example, if you win a championship of any sport, you know, pick your, pick your sport, um, that's invisible. You won something, you go onto the streets, nobody knows you won a championship. So to make something invisible physically noticeable, something that's tangible, you wear like a championship ring or... You wear a sash that says, I won the Miss America pageant, or whatever. I don't know what people do nowadays to show, right? Or you wear a shirt that says, Champion 2020. I don't know. Right? Whatever it is. Um, love is invisible. Somebody could say, I love you, and you're like, cool. Right? <laughs> it's invisible. But if somebody hugs you, and you feel the warmth, now that love is made manifest. It's, it's physical. That's what a means of grace is. God loves us. How can we make that some, into something that we could feel and taste and smell, right? So that's what the means of grace is. And for the past 2,000 years, the church has done some means of grace that still we practice today. And the one that we're going to practice today is called communion, but in other circles, they call it Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. It's, you know, and, and I'm going to explain to you, we're going to do that today. I'm going to explain to you what that looks like and what it means. So 2,000 years ago, a guy named Paul, who was one of the first Christians, he wrote, about this, he wrote a letter about this, talking about why it's so important that we celebrate God's goodness. And this is what he said. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper, communion, and why it is so centrally important. So he's about to tell us. 
The master Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, and listen to what Jesus says here, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. So what he's saying is this. I love you. And I love you so much that I'm willing to die for you. In a few minutes, when Jesus said this, in a few minutes, you're going to see me be taken away. And a few hours after that, you're going to see me hang on the cross and my body is going to break. So when you take this bread and you break it and you eat of it, I want you to think about how much I love you. God's love is being made manifest in a bread being broken. So every time you break this bread, I want you to remember that I love you. And then he picks up a little cup, and this is what he says. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Now, we'll talk about that in a second. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. So, what, so this idea of a covenant. A covenant is like a contract, the way that we approach God. In the old times, the Old Testament, the way that people approach God is, if you do what I told you to do, there's a bunch of rules, if you, if you do what I told you to do, then we're good. He says, but now, it's not going to be up to what you do that makes us good. It's what I'm going to do on the cross that's going to make us good. So we're changing the way the contract works. So every time you pick up this cup, I want you to think about the blood that I'm going to spill on the cross because every time you drink this, I want you to know that no matter who you are, what you do, what you have done, it doesn't matter anymore because it's what I'm doing on the cross that's going to connect us. There's a new way of connecting with God. So the bread is how much I love you. The cup is the new covenant, the new contract, the new way that we're going to connect. And then he says this. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions, because it's, it's a means of grace, right? The death of the master. So that's what we're going to do, communion. Now, for some of you youth, this is the first time you're going to be taking communion. Okay, and I want you to be scared because this is like an invitation. So next slide. We have bread and we have small cups of juice on both stations right here. This is what's going to happen. In a few minutes, Daniel's going to come up and he's going to play something on the guitar because a lot of times when the lights are dim and the music is playing, it's easier for us to, to focus and to meditate on the love of Jesus and the new contract that we have with God. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. And as soon as that happens, I'm going to go to this station and Pastor Stan is going to come to this station and you get to choose which station you want to go to but I'll, I'll tell you what's going to happen when you get there. When you get there, um, there's going to be a group of people that's going to be surrounding the table. And if there's already a group of people, you can just wait in line in the aisles. And um, the pastor is going to pick up the bread, and he's going to say, take a piece of this bread. So you break off a piece of bread from the loaf that we have there. It's King's Hawaiian. <laughs> it is so sweet. To, to, okay. Okay. So it's, it's good. And uh, you're going to take it. And as you take it, the pastor is going to explain to you, to remind you what it stands for. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you because he loves you. And then he's going to put the bread down. Don't eat the bread yet. You hold it in your hand. And then he's going to pick up the tray of cups, and then you're going to take a cup. And as you're taking it, the pastor is going to remind you what that stands for. This, is, this cup represents the blood of Jesus that you know, is, represents the new covenant. Take it. Don't drink it yet. And then together, the people who are gathered around the table will eat and drink together, and then the pastor will pray, and then you can go and sit down again. So that's, that's what this communion is going to look like. Different churches do it a little differently. This is how we do it here. And uh, then after everybody's done, we close in song, and then that's it. Okay, so um, if you're kind of nervous about taking communion for the first time, um, you don't have to come up alone. You can come up with your friends or with your parents or with your family, with your, you know. So, uh, yeah. And for those of you who are older and you're like, I've always taken communion, but I never knew what it really meant. Well, now we know. Okay. So, uh, Daniel, I'm going to ask you to come up, and uh, I'll close this in prayer.